Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I welcome in two guests. Today we have Robert Levy and Philip Block. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. If you both wouldn't mind, just briefly talk to us so we know who is who, so we can recognize the voices. We got two or really three guys here on the call. So I just want to make sure people know who's Philip and, and which one's Robert. Uh, so this is Rob Levy. Uh, hopefully you can <laughs> hear my voice. Um, and uh, I'll hand it off to Phil. Yeah, this is Phil Block. We do get confused for each other. We'll answer by either. I'll answer to Rob. We'll answer to Phil. It's all good. <laughs> right. If you're watching on the video, you'll be able to tell because they look they look a bit different. But if you're only <laughs> listening into the audio, I think it'd be good for you guys to know uh, who is who. So Phil, Rob, there's so much negative news around the retail sector with Amazon, store closings, and just the general retail apocalypse narrative. Why then did you guys decide to start investing there in the first place? And good question. Mostly because we, uh, we like punishment and we go, <laughs> we go against the grain. I think we're naturally contrarians. There's no question about that. And uh, we probably always have been. Um, but the, the truth is when people start talking in that way and retail apocalypse, and we started investing in this strategy you know, six years ago, uh, both with kind of deeper backgrounds, both in retail and in other sectors, that creates opportunity, right? That was our view that when, when people are saying negative things about something, it creates opportunity. And we really understood the space and we didn't believe that narrative to be true broadly. It certainly is within the mall space, within the B and C malls in the middle of the country where you have, you know, population declines and people moving. But we said, if you, if you buy open air shopping centers and you buy grocer and discount, stuff in, especially in the sun belt and in markets that are that are growing you buy really good real estate like that stuff performs fantastically and to be honest if you look at e-commerce the the truth of e-commerce is they don't make any money i mean even amazon doesn't really make money on e-commerce right they make money on data storage all of these companies the customer acquisition costs are so high that today you're seeing those stores that started as pure play e-commerce opening shops, opening brick and mortar stores around the country because it's a billboard for them, right? It's marketing. Uh, and we're the beneficiaries of that. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'll add is that we, it's kind of interesting, you know, we kind of you know, chuckle to each other a bit. We, we actually like bad news out in the marketplace because we feel that <clears throat> it's inaccurate. You know, what's happening on the ground in retail is different than what you're reading in, you know, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or hearing on, you know, some on CNN or wherever you, you get your news, it is different. And we, so we like the bad news because we feel people do focus on it. It makes it harder for us to raise capital, uh, makes it harder for us to, to borrow money. But we, there are people who understand the business well and it, it, it benefits us because we can buy stuff at, at better yields. I believe it was Warren Buffett that said this, but if it wasn't, it was another very successful stock investor who said that to beat the market, you have to be a contrarian, but you also have to be right. You can't just be a contrarian because if you're wrong, then it doesn't really matter, right? So how do you know when you're being a contrarian and you're right when everybody else is wrong versus when you might just be dead wrong? <laughs> well, so for some of that, it, it's our, our um, track record, right? I mean... We own today 11 deals, a few million square feet. We bought 20 or so over the last six years. And there's nothing that we're not hitting 20%-ish returns or more. We're, we're, we're cash flowing and outperforming certainly what we feel like we could do investing in other sectors. And a lot of that is because you have credit tenants with contractual rents and right based on their leases and so we're saying most of our income is coming from cash flow versus you know if you're doing a multifamily development and you're you know guessing on costs and you're hoping that you sell at a three cap because that's where the market is today and you build to a four or five and right and that's how you make your money we're cash flowing 10 percent, 12 percent, whatever the case might be every year most of our returns just coming straight from the cash flow on rents that are, you know, great tenants and we know what their sales are. 
So we can feel really, really confident in our underwriting. We, you know, our track record has shown us that we can both outperform, but but out underwrite. I think our our competitors and really, really feel comfortable. There are deals that we have no interest in chasing, and you know, a bunch of guys jump in, and there are others that you know we certainly take a different view, and and you know, the proofs in the pudding. Our uh, our returns are showing it. Right. And, and also just look at the at the public companies, the public retailers. So, you know, go out there and look at the TJ Maxx's of the world, the Walmarts, Target, uh, Ross, Burlington. Just look at their financial statements. They are extremely profitable companies. Their balance sheets are very, very strong. Not only did they did they survive the pandemic, the pandemic actually benefited retail because what it got what it did was it got rid of the stuff that was already failing. And now anything that any company that that got through the pandemic well is now in a fantastic um, financial position. So their profit margins are up, their balance sheets are stronger. And that's who our, our main tenants are. And you have that, and then you have you know these local guys who you know are smart local entrepreneurs. They're not giving up their their space. And so, you know, our collections have been close to hundred percent. Um, throughout the pandemic, our leasing velocity today is better than it has been since we started the company. Um, you know, so we see what's going on on the ground, and that that gets us very comfortable with our strategy. Phil, as you mentioned, your portfolio is now more than 1.8 million square feet, and it's approaching 300 million dollars in value. But the first deal you guys did was back in 2016, it was $8 million and you needed about 2.4 million in equity. Tell us about that first deal you ever did and how it differs from the deals you guys are doing today. <laughs> yeah, you're like, uh, you're bringing me back here. I'm trying to even remember. I mean, we were, scr- you're right. So Rob and I, you know, our backgrounds, we, we were at a public company um, for a long time, always in kind of institutional world. And we wanted to do this on our own and start our own business. And you know, the first deal you do is scary always, right? Because we're going out, we, we said to ourselves from that moment, we're going to find investments that we believe in. And if we believe in the investment in our returns, we'll be able to raise the capital. But you don't really know, right, until you do it. We believe that. It's proven to be true. But that first deal was scary. So we put it under contract and then we were calling everybody we knew, right, for a small equity raise, you know, at the time, I don't know, two and a half, three million bucks, whatever it was. And, and, you know, we were putting large checks ourselves and just, you know, scrounging, dialing for dollars, as they say. So we were, we were trying to find the, the, the right capital and it was much smaller, but it was fundamentally the same stuff. It was in a great market that was in Nashville. And, you know, we loved the Southeast. We love the sun, but we love Nashville. We still own a deal in Nashville today. So kind of the fundamentals of the real estate were exactly what we look for today. Cap rates were wider than for this kind of thing, but it had credit tenants, it had upside, it had an out parcel to sell, it had kind of all of the fundamentals that we look for and in place cash flow. Um, we rarely do deals of that size today because, you know, we've been fortunate and have grown and have found some more interesting opportunities uh, in kind of larger scale. A lot of that, frankly, is because more mom and pops have gotten in. I think as it's been harder to find multifamily deals, you have more kind of locals bidding up smaller deals because they can, you know, a local rich guy can come up with a few million bucks and buy a deal like that, but they're struggling to buy a 50, $60 million deal. So we've been kind of pursuing larger deals, but the fundamentals of what we're looking for haven't changed. In place cash flow, upside opportunity, good credit tenants, and great location. And so that, that was there then, and it's there for every deal we're doing now. You mentioned that there was an out parcel to sell. Is that just an extra piece of land that you can basically subdivide and sell off? Yeah, or develop in that case um, to, to develop and then sell. In, in most of our, what, what's really interesting in retail is the sum of the parts is often worth more than the whole. So if we can buy a, an overall center, let's use kind of rough math at like an 8% cap rate, the, the out parcels in front, so the maybe there's either a piece of land or maybe there's a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or something like that that's part of it. Well, those trade for, you know, I mean, a Chick-fil-A will be in the sub four cap, right? And so we can sell that, pay down debt, reduce our, our, uh, our equity balance and really enhance our cash flow. 
And we look for that almost always. I mean, not every one of our deals has those opportunities, but it really, it's an accretive, it's a way to kind of add a lot of value. It's very accretive to our transactions. In the area where I live, there was a, a strip mall that was recently, it was good size. It wasn't massive, but it was good size. And it was, I would say it was failing. It was mostly empty, probably 50, 60% empty. A, a major chain of grocery store had just left and somebody came in and bought it. And I think they did what you just mentioned is they built, they built the Chick-fil-A, I believe in the parking lot. They put in a bank or a credit union in the other end of the parking lot. I, you know, I don't know if they sold off that part of the, the land or the, or the property to, to do what you said, but I'm believing they're following a similar strategy to what you mentioned. Yeah, no, it makes all the sense in the world. And what would be really interesting in that, I mean, without knowing it, the, the grocers or your anchors typically in the REA or in their lease will control the land right in front of their store because they don't, they would prefer you not put something that's blocking visibility. So my guess is when that grocer was there, you couldn't have put a Chick-fil-A in front. They would have restricted it. But as soon as they go and the val- uh, you can, and now the value that's created from that is tremendous. So they, they likely did very well without knowing any details. Did either of you have any experience with real estate prior to going into that first deal that we just talked about? Had you bought any smaller deals personally on your own or any family or anything that had been in real estate? All we... Yeah, so we um, uh, our our histories were more on the institutional side. So, uh, as Phil said, you know, we ran a public company, pretty large public company in New York, which was primarily a multifamily finance and investment management company. Um, we were there for many years. We were in investment banking, private equity. we were, a lot of our history has been on the on the debt side, on the lending side of real estate. So it's kind of interesting from our perspective. We have we have done pretty much everything in real estate, um, except for up until six years ago, owning our own real estate. Um, but we felt like we came to that this business with like just massive backgrounds in how to finance, how to structure, how to buy, how to sell um, real estate, how to, how to operate a company, how to operate real estate. And that's what we, we've, we've kind of leveraged that experience over the past six years. We have a great team now. We have, we've built infrastructure. We, um, we have a whole team down in Atlanta and Charlotte, which is, and, and out in LA also, that is just, you know, uh, best in class from a property management, asset management, finance, leasing, um, acquisitions perspective. So we feel like we can, we really can run this business well. And the one thing we hadn't done was own an operator on real estate, but we felt very comfortable getting into that considering our backgrounds. And as Phil mentioned before, we also had backgrounds in multiple types of real estate. Uh, we have backgrounds in multifamily, as we mentioned, and lodging and other areas, which is, you know, kind of why we, you know, we, we targeted retail because of the contrarian nature and the value there, but we certainly have uh, skill sets that's in other, in other uh, sectors of real estate as well. Given your experience on both sides of the transactions, do you guys have a preference today? If you could, if you're going to start all over, would you go one route, one route over the other? When you say both sides, you mean? Like what you're doing on the public with the public company more oh. on the debt and lending side versus actually owning the real estate itself. Oh, I, I I don't want to speak for Phil, but I think I I will speak for him. I mean, I, we we love what we're doing now. I mean, it it was really exciting running a public company, and you know, it's different, right? You know, dealing with public shareholders and boards, and and uh, and we did well. With the, the the company that we ran, uh, you know, um, we did we did we did a really good job, I think, and and did well for our our shareholders and all the stuff that we were supposed to do as as stewards of a public company, but this is great. I mean, we love the entrepreneurial nature. We love building something from scratch. Uh, you know, six years ago, it was, it was me and Phil, and now we have a great team around us who, who are, are great partners of ours. We've raised great capital. We've made fantastic uh, connections and relationships. So I, I think what we're doing is really exciting. And, and I'm a bit older than Phil. You can't, you know, the, the, the folks on the, on the podcast can't see that. Um, I wish I, you know, everybody's, every entrepreneur, entrepreneur probably says this. I wish I did this 10 years ago. Yeah. Although I'd say, yeah, I, I mean, I obviously echo all of that. Um, but 
we, I think our backgrounds really kind of prepared us well for this. I mean, one thing that we like to say to our investors, I mean, listen, there are plenty of sponsors out there doing similar things to what we're doing who don't have the backgrounds, right? I mean, Rob is the CFO and then the CEO of a public company. There aren't too many folks, I think, with that background who who investors have the opportunity to entrust their capital with, because ultimately that's what this is, right? We're, we're fiduciaries for our investors. We take that really, really seriously. But I, I think our backgrounds in the public company space has really prepared us for that, because we try to bring more of an institutional view and risk uh preparedness to what we're doing versus probably what a lot of mom and pop sponsors do post 1986 and post 2009 are considered to be once in a lifetime acquisition opportunities for investors who are liquid and could take advantage of those opportunities do you guys see right now as one of those generational opportunities Um, I mean, it's certainly different today, right? There, in in retail, um, we do feel like this is an amazing opportunity. Um, there, wherever there's a dearth of capital, right, and that's that that's what created the opportunities that you mentioned, right? And you know, two thousand nine, we were in the in the trenches at our company, um, and certainly saw what opportunities were like when when there was a dearth of capital. Today, there is a, um, there's a tremendous amount of capital out there, but it's chasing deals that, mo- that most of which we're not chasing, right? It's in the industrial space, it's in the multifamily space. And you know, we've all seen you know, significant cap rate compression in those areas. And that's really what we love about retail, certainly. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, certainly, you know, buying retail at our current cap rates and current yields is, I think, um, is tremendous opportunity. I don't know if we're going to look back on it and say, wow, that was, you know, the, you know, the kind of the bottom that we kind of hit the bottom well, but we don't have to. We're buying great real estate in great markets. Demographics around us are, are fantastic. And, you know, we know how to buy real estate. We're buying stuff that has all the right things from a retail perspective. And, and whether it's, you know, the perfect time or not, it doesn't really matter to us. We're just buying the best stuff in the best markets and, um, you know, and then, and then operating it as, you know, as well as we can and, and performing for our investors. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't know how you can compare it to those. I certainly with the amount of capital that's out on the market today, how could you say that this is a kind of generational like opportunity from a macro standpoint? But as Rob said, what we're looking for is kind of fundamentally value, right? We're looking for cash flow, stability of cash flow that is misunderstood or mispriced by the market. And pockets of that exist all in, in all market cycles. And we are, you know, we feel like we are, we're finding that within the retail sector today. Parts of the retail sector, you're, you're not. I mean, the compression in grosser uh, in you know grosser deals in the Sun Belt today would make those kinds of transactions very challenging that doesn't mean you wouldn't find any individual ones but like it's it would be impossible to say that they're, they're mispriced today but but other parts of the retail sector certainly are an interesting part of your approach is that you guys often buy from REITs and other large institutional sellers before we dive into that strategy specifically, a lot of our audience is newer investors who are buying much, much smaller deals. We're talking duplexes, triplexes, maybe small multifamily and not buying what is considered to be historically at least institutional quality real estate. So tell us a little bit about what REITs are and what the other large institutional sellers are. Um, yeah, you know, so REITs, uh, it stands for Real Estate Investment Trusts. It is a, you know, publicly, well, there are private REITs also, but, um, you know, public or private companies that are, that are structured, there's a tax benefit to owning and operating real estate. And, and the, the tax benefit is that they can pass through uh, the income of that, of that company to their investors, their shareholders, um, and the corporation does not get taxed. You only get taxed at the individual level. So it's a very a, a tax efficient way to own real estate. And um, yeah, so we, uh, and there's other 
major institutions out there that are that are kind of in our space, uh, private equity companies, uh, insurance companies, um, endowments, et cetera, who are also acquiring in our space. And as you said, we love to buy from them. You know, they, for a number of reasons, they tend to own, uh, they're, they're good at the acquisition side. They tend to own the best real estate in really good markets. They tend to capitalize those transactions well. So they put capital into their deals. They have, you know, uh, new roofs or, you know, parking lots, whatever. They, they don't, um, they don't under capitalize their, their properties. And so we're buying, you know, the best real estate in good markets, um, that have that that have been well cared for, but they also don't do the small things that we do every day. I mean, retail is one of those businesses where you have to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty every day. It is a it is a day to day hard business uh, if you really want to make money and do the best that you can. And um, and so they don't do all those small things. They don't care as much about leasing the 1,000 square foot space. They focus on leasing the 20,000 square foot space. But you make your money on the smaller spaces and they don't... Um, they don't do some of the out parcel um, transactions that we just talked about, where we're you know carving out out parcels and selling them at very accretive levels. So it's all those small things that we do that really creates the opportunity. And we love uh, we, we've we've bought a number of transactions from these big public companies uh, and some big private equity groups, and we feel like we can. There's a, just a, a lot of low hanging fruit in those tra- transactions for us. Is that why it's a selling point for you guys? I know you often tell that you're buying from REITs and other large institutional sellers as a selling point. Is that because you're getting this high quality real estate with kind of this built in piece that you know that they were probably missing? Um, yeah, again. No, I mean, I, you jump in, Rob, but I, yeah, I think that, that certainly that is a piece of it. Buying institutional quality asset with really strong tenants and good markets, like the, all of the things that REITs do well, as Rob said, that is, I think, a, a benefit to our investors. And the challenge with investing in REITs is you have, they have somewhat different um, incentives than us, which is just maximize value, maximize return to our investors. They're trying to hit a 4% coupon to the investors and that's it. And it's a, you know, so it's a different way of thinking about real estate and looking at it. We're trying to to have to hit, you know, solid cash flow and then outsized returns because that's the only way that we make money. So it, but, but we're starting with really good real estate. I think that's, that, that's right. Right. Also they, you know, the public companies, they have different uh, pressures than we do, right? They have to respond to the, the analyst community that covers them and the investment bankers and et cetera. They have, and the, and the large shareholders that are investors in their companies, we don't have to deal with that. And so, and sometimes that pressure that they get from those investors or from the, uh, from, you know, the Wall Street community makes them make decisions that, uh, you know, in our view are, either non-economic or less economic or, you know, not strategic, right? So, and it, it also forces them, they all kind of tend to gather and, um, and you know, focus on all the same stuff. So, you know, they're all now focused in the retail space. All these public companies are now focused on buying in the Southeast and Southwest, right? Every one of them has stated publicly that they are going to be investing dollars in, um, you know, in, in these, in the, the high growth states. And that makes a ton of sense. Phil and I have been doing that. LBX, we've been doing that for six years now. But so they're selling assets in the Midwest and other markets, maybe that are not as high growth, but you know, great pieces of real estate. And they're buying. Everybody's buying in the southeast and southwest. And so cap rates are going down in the southeast and southwest. And and so that that provides us opportunity to buy elsewhere, right? So we're just trying to stay one step ahead of them. If they're buying, if they if if they're buying, we want to be selling to them. And if they're selling, we want to be buying from them. Hey everyone, Clay Fink here, host of the Millennial Investing Podcast. Today I wanted to tell you guys about this exciting new investment tool called Titan. Titan is an investment platform that was made for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experienced analysts. With how hectic life can get at times, why not outsource your investments to the experts? They offer three equity portfolios and America's very first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, 
Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of their four portfolios on an after-fee basis. They aim to grow your investments by 15% annually, and at this rate of growth, this implies your money doubling every five years. My favorite fund is their flagship fund, which invests in the highest quality large cap growth stocks in the US. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you sign up through our link, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. What makes shopping center, asset management, property management, and leasing so different from that of other real estate asset classes? I think you, you add, just add kind of layers of complexity, which is what's exciting and interesting and in how you can add value. But you have the credit. So if you just kind of step back, you've got tenants here. So in, in like use multifamily, you have one year leases to individuals, right? So you don't have credit. I mean, you try to do make sure that you have decent credit scores and incomes for the people that you're renting to, but they're individuals. For us, we have TJ Maxx and Publix and Kroger, right? And Target and use big names that you'd know. So we can do credit analysis on the individual tenants. Then you take it another step. So you have the credit, you have a certain amount of term on your lease up to kind of 10 years typically. And so when that rolls, how much money are we going to have to give them to stay? What are their sales? You're doing a whole extra level of analysis on the kind of supply and demand for that specific space in that market, the existing rents, what you think mark, the rents are going to go to, what the credit of, of that guy is, what the credit of alternatives are, what's going to drive cap rates down because again everything's being priced on stability of cash flow so if you're able to bring in a grocer the view of the stability of the cash flow changes so you can spend a lot of money because it's going to change the and really kind of transform the cap rate to the overall center and leasing leasing is a is a very challenging kind of boots on the ground like roll up your sleeves and dig in business and one of the reasons, uh, as Rob mentioned, that we like buying from REITs is they mostly lease from a national headquarters, right? They do it themselves. What we found is it's almost impossible to do that effectively, right? You can have the national and regional relationships and do that really well. And we do in our head of leasings in Charlotte, and he's absolutely tremendous. And so from our experience and his experience, we bring kind of all the national and regional tenants and know how they're performing and can pick up the phone and speak to them. And it's really important that you have those types of relationships to be able to do what we do. But then if you're going to lease 2000 square foot, 1000 square foot shop space and keep that occupied, you need to have people local on the ground who are going around to every local tenant, anybody that they think might be looking to expand or move. And that's how you really drive occupancy in the small shop space. So it's, it's like, it's multi-layered uh, approach that you just don't have any of those types of uh, relationships or dynamics going on in, you know, use multi as an example. I've often wondered myself, why are some of those big names that you mentioned, not just buying their own space, Publix, Target, any of the other really big names that you've mentioned, why don't they just buy their own space? Why are they leasing it? Well, they do. I mean, the, the, the biggest, so Publix owns a lot of shopping centers. And first of all, it's capital intensive. So for the right retailer, right, their job is not to be a real estate company. Publix, because it's private, can do it and it makes some sense. And they don't have investors in the market saying this isn't a good use of your capital. So Publix does buy, in, but largely in Florida, because that's where they're headquartered. So they own a lot of shopping centers. They'll bid against you on shopping centers. They'll have a, a rofer, a right of first refusal on most of their deals in Florida, depending on when they cut the lease and, and how you negotiated it. Um, Target often, the way Target developments get done is that Target does buy the land in, with very few exceptions. They will buy the land from the developer, build the Target, and then you build the shopping center around them. Um, and then... If you're like a Ross or a TJ Maxx or those types of tenants, which is Burlington, right? Really good credit, soft, good type folks. 
there's no way the public markets want them to use their capital to buy real estate. It's just, they're not a large enough piece of the overall centers for it to make sense. Now, why doesn't Whole Foods, if you're Amazon, I don't know, because I could see that making some sense and it's such small potatoes in the scale of a trillion dollar company or whatever Amazon is today, but um, but they don't and we're the beneficiary of those types of, of tenants and their credit. Are your tenants mostly these bigger name companies or do you have like smaller strip mall type tenants, you know, mom and pop, small businesses, I guess SMBs as well? Yeah, it's a huge mix for sure. I mean, there's no, there, there are, very, again, with very few exceptions, like we bought a deal in Chicago that's almost all national and regional uh, tenants, but most shopping centers, it's what you know, right? When you go to, to your local, you know, what, what grocery store do you go to close by? So in New England, at least like New Hampshire, Massachusetts, our biggest is uh, called Market Basket. So you go to Market Basket and what's a Market Basket, maybe there's a Starbucks and there's a pizza place and a nail salon and right. I mean, typically that's your, your grocer anchored centers. There's a pretty kind of common lineup that you'll see in those types of folks. Maybe now there's increasing medical uses and some of those will be local, some will be national, like an Aspen Dental or or an urgent care, you know, some of the larger, larger chains, but it's a mix. Uh, and then your larger power centers, box space, they're more national. You know, you don't have too many local guys taking 25,000 square feet spaces. So, it, but, but those centers perform really well. So it depends. We have both. People listening to the podcast and myself included, we like to hear about the numbers and yields on investment. So talk to us a bit about how you manage between going for a cash flow versus appreciation and what do you typically target for your cash yield and your IRR? Well, that's one of the things we, we really love about retail um, is that the lion's share of our returns come from cash flow. Um, you know, when we're buying an asset, I mean, it, it depends of course, you know, asset by asset, but on average, we're probably buying at, you know, kind of seven to eight, uh, cap rates somewhere in there. And then, you know, we're not high leverage borrowers. We typically are putting on 60 to 65% bank debt. We don't use the securitized markets like CMBS or something like that, just because we, we feel it's not the right way to borrow money um, and owning and operating real estate. So, you know, you borrow money at, you know, three and a half or three and three quarters percent, you buy something at a seven and a half or an eight cap rate. Um, and you're usually cash flowing in the kind of high single digits or maybe it's the low double digits day one. Um, hopefully that grows over time as we, you know, lease space, you know, if there's, if there's some vacancy or, you know, we're pushing some, some rental rates, whatever it might be. So we're kind of pushing our cash yields, our annual cash yields into the double digits and, you know, kind of, uh, 12, 13, 14% range. And then as, you know, Phil had mentioned before, we're doing work on some out parcels or, uh, or something like that. And, uh, creating some value that way. And, and so we're typically underwriting to kind of high single digit, low double digit cash flow and all in returns and kind of into the you know mid to upper teens uh, IRRs over a five or so year hold. That's kind of our standard return you know package. Return. You've been in business for about six years now. Are you typically holding properties for about five years? Is that what you've ended up doing, or have you ended up selling most of them a little bit earlier? Do you plan on holding longer for some of them? Uh, we are. I mean, you know, uh, our goal is to own great real estate, and so what we have found, and, and what our investors are are communicating to us, is that they don't. We don't want to sell a lot of these assets, right? We we've been able to create value, uh, refinance the assets, take most or, or if not all of the equity out, and then still hold on to them in cash flow at really attractive levels. Because if we returned all the equity, we sold the asset and we and we return everything. Uh, sure, that return would be fantastic for everybody. But then you have that cash sitting there and, and yields today are, are maybe not as attractive. And so in certainly, you know, in a, in a lot of different areas of real estate. So, um, so, so far we have not sold anything. Um, we have, and, and some of that also is because we're in the middle of our business plans, right? We're still pushing occupancy and, and pushing rents and working on out parcel opportunities, whatever it might be. So there, there are still things that we want to accomplish at these assets. Um, but our goal is to own and operate 
great real estate long term. Some of it will certainly sell shortly. Like there's one asset that we'll probably be bringing to market over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but we've also been able to really effectively refinance our assets and, and, and pull a lot of equity out and, and continue to operate them. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. How do you determine if you're ready to sell a property? What, what factors are you looking at? Well, we're really, we, we have a business plan up front and we're really clear on it. And our investors all know exactly what that business plan is. And so our job is to execute that business plan. And then what we've always said and what we've done is we you get to the end of that business plan, whether maybe that's lease up, you know, the 10% vacancy, sell an out parcel and push rents on, you know, a space or two. So now we've executed. And what do the capital markets look like at that point? And that's how we determine, as Rob said, whether does it make sense to sell? Does it make sense to refinance and get everybody their money back and continue to, you know, to, to ride the investment long term. Um, but we have very clear objectives up front and listen, those certainly can evolve and maybe opportunities present themselves in an asset that we didn't prepare for or didn't expect up front. But we have, you know, three or four objectives, sometimes more, sometimes less of, of exactly what we want to do. And then, you know, we, so we know we're tracking those. We're we're reporting, frankly, to our investors how we're doing on those specific, uh, you know, very kind of tangible objectives from from the beginning. How do you determine rental rates in an asset class like this? I'm guessing you do it on a square foot basis, but how are you coming up with what you should charge on a, on a square foot basis? I mean, that's comps and having really good leasing folks. The, honestly, the hard part's not, is it, the market will dictate just like anything else, right? What's the... What are people willing to, to pay? The, there, there are different types of tenants who pay different types of rents, and that's largely a matter of how much money you have to spend. So if you have, you know, there are the centers that you probably go to, like the best local restaurants and the build outs are crazy, right? How much money did the local developer spend for that build out of that sushi restaurant that has no guarantee on it? It's just, or maybe it does, but it's a local, local guy. And that's a different type of risk. And some of that space is fantastic and right? It's where you'll go out to eat with your family and it's so cool and it's a local restaurant, but that's a certain type of risk. And, you know, your investors have to be prepared for that type of risk because those restaurants fail and now you're going to spend a lot of money on the next guy, but they'll pay increased rent because you're taking that type of risk. Uh, the key really is underwriting it appropriately upfront and to make sure that you can, you know, that your objectives are attainable. And we spent a lot of time with our leasing team, with whatever the local leasing teams, we meet with kind of with everybody, you know, since we're not building, we're buying. So we know what people are paying. We'll look at every competing center around. So we know exactly what tenants and competing centers are paying, how much money had to go to those tenants. And the larger guys are all represented by uh, a tenant rep broker. And so we speak to the tenant rep brokers. We know what all of the largest tenants are, are looking for in the market, how much they're willing to pay and how much a landlord's going to have to spend to get them to come. When you say how much the landlord's going to have to spend to get them to come, you've also mentioned uh, briefly a couple of different times, different terms of having to give uh, the potential tenant money or something along those lines. What is that about in, in this asset class? We don't do that typically in the smaller residential space. So talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, that's sorry, sorry, I should have been more clear. That's so tenant allowance. When a tenant is coming to our center, to any center, you'll they'll you you exchange uh, letters of intent LOIs. And so they'll come and they'll say, you know, I'll pay you fifteen dollars a foot, say, right? And that's quoted per year. So fifteen dollars per square foot per year in rent plus triple net. So I'll reimburse for my share of of CAM, of common area maintenance, and I'll re reimburse for taxes. And for that, I need 20,000 square feet and I need it to be, maybe it's as is, right? I'll just take it, There's this box exists and I'll take exactly what's there. Maybe it needs to be white boxed. I want, you know, four walls that, and I'll do the rest. And then on top of that, they're gonna say, I'm gonna spend $5 million, you know, whatever it costs for a specific tenant to build out. We want you landlord to help us with that. We're asking for $50 a foot. And so we're, we're, how we think about it is what's our, like 
like any investor, good investor, is what's our return on that investment? Right? We're going to spend money. We're going to give you a tenant allowance so that you can build out your Marshall space or your TJ Maxx space or your you Publix, right? You're going to build out this beautiful store and you're going to spend money. So you're taking risk and we're willing to spend some money to take that risk, but we have to get a return on that investment. So how much is the rent uh, at what, you know, is our payback period three years? Is it five years? Are we going to sell it quickly? And what's the cap rate? And so what's your kind of net return on that investment? But that's how, how we think about it and, and the conversations that we have. We've talked a bit about your guys' opinion on the retail sector as a whole, but kind of regardless of your opinion and what your company thinks, banks and lenders have their own opinions too, which I think probably makes financing these types of properties a little bit more difficult. So how are you approaching financing and does the sector actually make getting financing a bit more hard? Definitely. <clears throat> this is, it's, um, the, I mean, it's the pros and cons of investing in a sector that is not um, you know, is, is not as well loved as some of the other sectors, right? So you're going to have fewer lenders. Um, when we go out to market, you know, let's say we go out to 50 lenders on a, on a transaction and we'll get back, you know, five or six or seven sets of terms, as opposed to if you went out with multifamily or industrial, you, you would get many more, uh, potential lenders kind of sending you, sending you terms. Um, so that's the negative side, but the positive is that you know Phil and I both, as we mentioned, come from the finance world. We have some great relationships with banks and and credit unions and life companies, and we also have a, a great relationship on the on the broker side. We have a, a broker, uh, or a couple of brokers who do great work with us uh, and help us make sure that we're we're kind of hitting the whole market. So there are few, there are definitely fewer lenders out there in our space, but you know we we build that into our underwriting. We know where our cost is going to be. We uh, we have a very good feel for how we're going to finance it. As as we mentioned before, we're not we're not looking for anything high leverage. We're not you know we're very conservative borrowers, um, and we don't uh, we you know we primarily focus on kind of relationship banking or life company lending, which is, you know, for us, the kind of the, the perfect spot to be. So it, it is a little bit more of a challenge, but, um, you know, it's kind of the, the game of playing in a, in a contrarian market. What is life company lending? Is that from a life insurance company? Yeah. So life companies are some of the largest lenders out there in the real estate world. Um, you know, they have a very specific, more specific focus. They tend to be kind of um, longer term lenders. Um, and uh, whereas banks, you can get a little bit more short term uh, type borrowing, but we like life company uh, debt because it is tends to be lower leverage, which is fine with us, tends to be, um, you know, kind of longer term. The, 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 the challenge with life company borrowing is that they, they tend to not uh, allow for much prepayment flexibility. And we do like to build in prepayment flexibility into our loans so that if we see an opportunity in the markets to sell, we can sell and we don't have to, to deal with existing debt and prepayment uh, you know, fees and stuff like that. And that's where bank lending can be a little bit uh, you know, better for us because we, we can build it on the bank side a little bit more prepayment flexibility. Um, so you know, it, just, it really just depends on the, the property, the transaction, you know, our structuring, and we ensure, make sure that the, the, the loan that we're putting on a property kind of matches the, the business plan for that transaction. Similar to your lenders who probably have a negative perception, at least, of, of this kind of industry of real estate. I'm guessing your investors, or at least many of them, probably have a similar kind of perception. So how do you convince them that this type of asset class isn't actually dying and it's it's worth investing in versus other popular sectors like multifamily or data warehouse storage or or anything like that. We have conversations like this, I think is the real answer. Yeah, it's I mean it depends, right? That because we have all different types of investors, so institutions, high net worth, uh, family offices. It, it so the conversations vary, but it's honestly it's a lot of this. It's a lot of the kind of hand to hand combat we got. We have to explain it. As we said, as I, you know, as I said, from our first investment, you know, when you asked about that, it's no different from the very beginning. We have to sit down and explain if we like something, why, you know, we always said we can raise the money and we still, you know, that's proven to be true. We always feel like that's true. 
but um, the nature that, uh, you know, the dynamic that you're um, discussing here is what makes retail interesting and exciting for us because you necessarily have less demand uh, because of the types of questions you're asking. People are concerned, but that means we got to, we got to explain it to folks and, and why it makes sense. And, you know, so far we've been successful with that, but it, it's, uh, it, you know, it doesn't change from deal to deal. I think we, we, again, we performed really well. And so we have a lot of repeat investors, largely repeat investors who want to continue to invest with us, which we're, you know, we're really grateful for, but we have to, you know, we got to keep performing and adding new investors. Who do you guys define as your competition? Is it firms and other companies that are trying to buy the same deals as you? Is it only them? Or is it really anybody that is trying to raise capital from investors, maybe the same type of investors as you guys are? I mean, our, our view is that this is such a big space, right? And we don't, um, you know, we, we, what we compete against is, in our view, is more of the, the folks who are investing in similar types of assets than we are. Um, I guess in a way we do, I guess, you know, um, compete against any sponsor because we're all trying to raise capital, but it's such a big space that, that we don't really, that doesn't concern us. But what's interesting again about the retail world, it's kind of, you know, the theme of what we're talking about here is that there are just fewer buyers, right? I mean, if you're, if you're bidding on a, you know, call a multifamily uh, property today, you're probably bidding against 40 or 50 other bidders, right? So you've got to, you know, really be, you know, in effect, you have to be aggressive to get there, right? You have to be that guy who is going to uh, beat out, you know, 40 or 50 other bidders. In our world, you know, it, it just doesn't happen. It's not like that. There's just many, many, many fewer bidders. So we're typically bidding against, you know, three, four, five, maybe seven bidders, real bidders on a transaction. And, and we have a good reputation in the marketplace. The, the brokers know us. They know we can perform. Um, they know that we, you know, underwrite our deals very in, in a lot of detail and that we, when we put a, a, a number on the table that we can execute at, we will execute at that number. Um, and so, you know, we're, it's just, it's just a, a whole different ball game. We're just many fewer uh, people out there who are focused on this space. And that's beneficial to us. That, that allows us to acquire assets at, at better yields. Does that relative lack of competition make your asset class a bit more inefficient and provide some potentially better investment opportunities? Sure. Yeah. When you guys were getting into, I mean, even throughout your whole career, but even as you're getting into entrepreneurship, what have been some of the, the most influential books in your life? Uh, influential books, you said? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and if neither of you are readers, that's okay too. We're just, we're really big readers here. Um, I mean, I'm, we're, we're readers. I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> recently we've been reading more, um, more documents and leases and, um, uh, and purchase and sale agreements and stuff like that. Um, so I have, I have not read as much as I would like to recently. Phil, you, you read a little bit more than I do. I do read books. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think in the context of this conversation, like what right. I, I don't read, I read, I do read a bunch of biographies. I don't read, I, I can't think of anything, honestly, that is like been kind of foundational for what we're doing. I kind of read as an escape, honestly. <laughs> and um, I said, I said, I, I do like, you know, I, I read biographies of presidents. I think that's all interesting, but I don't read it with the intent of like, now I'm going to manage LBX in the way that they like led this. That's, that's not how I think about it. I don't know. That's not that helpful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, honestly, we, we're working really hard. Um, and it's not, I, I wish I, we read, or at least I wish, I wish I read more. Um, we are working long hours. We're traveling. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a passion for what we're doing. And um, I feel like at some point we're going to have this company where we need it to be, where we want it to be. And maybe we can take a half a step, not a half step back, but we'll have a little bit more time to um, to read some some nonfiction or some fiction and really enjoy <laughs> it. But right now, right now uh, we're focused. 
Have you read, uh, Robert, have you read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? Yes, I have. Yeah, like that's one of the books that I read most recently. I'm trying to think about the Myros. I mean, I loved it. I think it's super interesting. I'm not sure that it changes like how we think about real estate investing, but um, great book. It's an interesting perspective. I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong. I mean, obviously you guys are, are successful, but like most people that we have on the show, they, they can rattle off 50 books that they've read in the last two years or, you know, so it's definitely interesting to get a different perspective and from some people that are, are still successful without reading, you know, if people, I think some people are, are busy like you guys and they're like, I, like they stress themselves out because they cr- they feel like they have to cram in these books just because it's a prerequisite to be successful but you guys are, pro- I mean, you guys are proof and I'm sure there's many others that you don't have to necessarily read to be successful. Well, I wouldn't say we're not reading. We're, we're reading uh, <laughs> a lot, but I'm just, we're at least personally, I'm reading, you know, just a, a ton of, I guess we consider it nonfiction, right? I, I read the Wall Street <laughs> Journal every day. I read The Economist. I read um, a lot filings. of real estate. Yeah. yeah. Public filings of companies that we're interested in and, and, you know, um, you know, a lot of real estate journals and a lot of retail information. And, you know, that is, it's time consuming, right? I mean, this, we're, this takes hours upon hours a day to focus on. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we are big readers. It's, uh, at least I am, but it's just in a different way right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's definitely, at least it's a different, it's a kind of different medium, but regardless, you guys are still reading. So I guess there's still some, uh, principle here that that holds true for most people that come on the show. But Rob, Phil, I've really enjoyed talking about the the uh, retail sector. We haven't done that here on the show yet, so it's definitely interesting to hear and learn a bit more about it. For those listening today that are interested in learning more about you guys, your business, LBX, uh, where can they go to find you? Where's the best place? Our website's great: www.lbxinvestments.com. That's probably the easiest. You can sign up. Investors can sign up on there and then we'll make sure that we, you know, our IR person will call and make sure that they see our opportunities. I'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes for anybody that's interested in checking it out. Guys, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.